would with me, go ahead and pull out your Bibles this morning, and go with me to the book of Haggai in the Old Testament. This is going to be our fourth and last week in Haggai. If you've not been with us or if you're unfamiliar with Haggai, it is a short little book in the Bible, one of the shortest in the Bible. If you go to the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, turn back just a few pages. It's just a, a couple of books from the end of the Old Testament. You'll find it there. Uh, this is a pretty power-packed book. We just took a, took a month to do a, a short sermon series walking through the book of Haggai. And we've entitled this Building God's Kingdom. And while you're getting there, just, just real quickly, I think because we we got to tie all this together and see... Um, and see where, where we come from and where we land today. Uh, today is pivotal in this, in this series. It is, uh, it is power-packed. It's, it's something I think that God uh, definitely had a message for Israel as, he was, as, as this was being shared, but it's a message for us today. So just to kind of recap, kind of to bring this up to speed, and we'll put a few of these things on the screen just to kind of help us get back to where we were, but... We have to remember that, that the whole premise of this thing was that God's people, Israel, had chosen to sin. They made some very deliberate choices in turning away from God and making sinful, sinful choices. And so they kind of got to this place, and we said it last week, and maybe we've all been here before, where we begin to say, I never imagined I would be at this place. Like, how did, like I wanted to serve God, I wanted to be faithful, but then we turn around and and we've, uh, we've let sin enter in, and we, we get to a place and we say, how did I get here? You kind of relate with me? Y'all can talk to me today. I mean, we, we, we turn around all of a sudden, and life has gone bad, and things have happened, and we go through struggles and disappointments and sin failures, and, and it's not that things haven't been good too, but mixed and all that, and we turn around and say, how did I get to this place? How did I get here? And so here Israel is, and they're walking in sin, and, and the story kind of went like this. Um, at, because of their sin, God allowed them to face the consequences. They were, uh, they were taken captive by Babylon. They were exiled out of Judah, out of Jerusalem. They were, they were made captives in Babylon. And for 50 years, these people are separated from their homes. Okay? And so uh, for 50 years, that's, that's the way it was. And then God allows, by His grace, allows a, a remnant of people to come back to Judah, back to Jerusalem. They're led by this, by this guy with a weird name. His name was Zerubbabel. He, he raises up Zerubbabel to lead them back. And when they come back home, they find that Jerusalem is in ruins. They find the temple is, uh, the temple is destroyed. And, uh, and they're devastated over it. So they immediately begin to put priority on the things of God. They, be, they begin, you remember this, this was from Easter Sunday, that first week. This is the first chapter of Haggai. They begin to rebuild the temple. They put priority back on the thing that was the highest of priorities. But it didn't last very long. It, it didn't last long. They began to face persecution. They began to face opposition. Um, it becomes harder to, to focus on what God says was the first priority. And so they stopped doing what they were supposed to do. They stopped the rebuilding of the temple. So for 16 years, while they're supposed to be focused on building the temple first, they begin, to, they begin to reestablish the commerce of Judah. The, the, they, they begin to build their businesses. They begin to rebuild all their homes. And life is going great, but they're not focused on kingdom priority. And that was the first week. That was Easter Sunday. We looked at Haggai 1, and, we, and we'll put this on the screen. Here's, here's one of the, the, the recap is that there's a danger when we have misplaced priorities. That they misplaced their priorities. They were active, but they were active in the wrong things. It, it, they were not living with kingdom priority. And all I could think about is just in this recap, and I don't even think I shared this scripture the first week when we did this, but, but I kept going back to what, what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33, when Jesus said this, but seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will then be added to you. And we live in a society, we live in a world that says put yourself first, do all your stuff and things first, and if you can fit God in, then do it. But God says, Jesus says, seek first my kingdom. Seek first my righteousness, and then all these things will be added. So there's a danger in misplaced priorities. And then we got to week two. We got to, to Haggai chapter two. We looked at the first nine verses. And, and that week, we see, you know, and see what happened with Haggai was that God sent him, and he gives them four messages over a period of time. He was God's prophet for that time, and he speaks these messages to them. 
So the first one, and we said it the first week, was get back to your priorities. You've laid off 16 years. Get back to building the temple. And then we see the second message, and that was week two. And we talked about the trap of discouragement. Okay, that was the second thing we saw, the, the trap of, of discouragement. And, and I just want to ask you this morning as we enter in, I'm just going to be real honest. You don't have to raise your hand. You don't have to shake your head or anything. You don't have to tell anybody. You know and God knows, but let me just ask you, are you discouraged? Are, are you walking through a discouragement right now? Has it been a long season? Or maybe, maybe it's been a short time, but are you discouraged right now? They were too focused. And what happened with them was they were too focused on the past. You've got to realize these people were in exile for 50 years. And so some of them that came back, some of that 50,000, some of them were old enough to remember the old temple, the old Jerusalem. Some of them were, you know, maybe now they were in their, their, maybe they were in their 60s. Maybe they were children when the exile started. Or maybe they were in their 70s or 80s now. And they're remembering the old temple. And, and they were too focused on the past to see that God was with them and that God had a plan for them. They start rebuilding this new temple and they say it's never going to be like the old one was. I mean, they were remembering the, the glory of Solomon's old temple and they're saying it's never going to be like it was. And Haggai goes to them and he gives them this reminder that you've got to quit focusing on the past. You're only guaranteed today. You, you're, you're here right now, so you've got to live in today and you've got to focus on what God can bring. And so it was just this reminder that when we're walking through discouragement and we're saying, I can't believe I've gotten to where I am and I wish things could be the way they used to be, that sometimes we've got to stop and we've got to say, the Spirit of God is with me and I've got to walk in the ways of God and I've got to do it from here on out. This trap of discouragement. And then, then, then coming back to last week and we're building up to where we go today, we looked at Haggai chapter 2, verses 10 through 19 and we talked last week about the challenge of obedience. And we talked about how obedience, walking in the ways of God, takes effort. I was reminded of what Paul told the church at Galatia. In Galatians 6, 9, he told the believers in Galatia, he said, let us, listen to this, he said, let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. This, uh, it, I, I shared a quote with you last week, and it was just a simple one. It says, a holy man is an awesome weapon in the hands of God. And we shared the scripture that, that, King David, uh, that King David shared in Psalm 139 where he said, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. That's Psalm 139, 23 and 24. And so we talked last week about the importance of obedience. Listen, none of us, if any Christian sitting in this room or watching online this morning, if you're a Christian, if you're saved by the grace of God, you didn't get there by your obedience. You were never good enough to be saved. You're still not good enough to be saved today. You never will be. If you're saved, you were saved by the grace of God. And obedience comes as a result of salvation. In other words, we're thankful that God, out of His grace and mercy, plucked us out of death and brought us into life. And because of that, because we're thankful that God has saved us, we begin to want to walk in a pattern of obedience. And man, we fail. Y'all, you ever shake your heads here? We fail at it every day, don't we? We all fall short of the glory of God. So obedience is a pattern of growth where we want to, our want to's change. And we want to walk in obedience with God because we are saved. And now we get to the end of chapter 2, this short book. And we're going to look at the last four verses this morning. And, and we find something that honestly I believe if we'll give our hearts to it this morning, it's going to hit us deep. I pray that we would have our hearts open to what God wants us to hear today. Listen, I kind of thought through this this week. It, it, as, as we walk away from here in just a few minutes, in just a few minutes, I hope that we walk away understanding some things very clearly. I'm, I'm going to put them on the screen this morning. Here's some things. Like If you don't get anything else today from this Scripture, just please walk away knowing this and seeing this. Number one, this life is temporary and it's fleeting quickly. This life is temporary. And it is fleeting very quickly. Okay? If that doesn't shake you at the core, here's the second thing we've got to see. Because Haggai is saying it. God's using him to say it to, to the people. The second thing is this. A shaking at the hand of God is coming. A shaking at the hand of God is coming. Now, here's the deal. Here's the third thing. And I think this brings it into perspective. God's God and He can do that. God is sovereign and He's totally in control. That would be the third thing. 
that I hope we see this morning. God is sovereign, which means He is all-sufficient. He's all-knowing. Nothing surprises God. Nothing ever takes God uh, by surprise. I mean, God knows everything. He is sovereign. He's totally in control. God's not just sitting up in heaven hoping things just work out the way He wants them to. God's God, and it's going to work out the way God wants it to. And fourth, here's this. And this may not be grammatically correct, but I think we'll get it. You don't want to not know Him. You don't want to not know Him. Let's just be real honest this morning. All of us need some encouragement from time to time, don't we? We all need some, some encouragement. We all struggle from time to time, don't we? We, we, we don't, let's don't play church this morning. Like we all struggle from time to time. Maybe you're struggling right now in some area of your life, and just if, if you were just being honest, you feel like giving up. I, I know that some of you, and I have too at times, have come to a crossroads in life, and you don't know which road to take. And, and the reality is that these things um, are very real in your life. And, and you don't need a churchy answer. You don't, you don't need somebody just to give you a couple of self-help tips and it not be founded in the Word of God like you need something real. And, and, I, and I've been thinking about it a lot just, just, just in a few weeks. Josh mentioned at the beginning of the service, we're going to honor our graduates. I mean, th there's some of you sitting in this room this morning and you're going to be graduating from high school or from college and you're facing that question like what am I going to do with the rest of my life listen some of you have been married for 20 years or 30 years and you have three kids and the nice house and the and the job and the dog and all that kind of stuff and you're still asking what am I going to do with the rest of my life some of you have grandkids and you're as old as Methuselah and you're still asking what am I going to do with the rest of my life. Listen, some of us lack confidence that we can do what God has called us to do because the reality has hit us pretty hard that our confidence is shot and we're not trusting in God like we should. We're focused on ourselves and we're focused on the here and now rather than having our eyes on the eternal. And I want to give you some words of encouragement this morning from these last few verses of Haggai. Encouragement... Encouragement to me comes in many forms, and maybe you've had times where you felt encouraged. I mean, just in a very simple form, encouragement can come from a pat on the back, from somebody saying, good job. Or maybe a, a smile that you weren't expecting, and somebody just brightens your day. A friendly phone call instead of the one you dreaded. A cheerful word from a friend. Somebody that just listens and doesn't have a whole lot to say, but they're just willing to listen. Maybe that's a source of encouragement. And this morning, we're going to see how God encouraged His people by encouraging... Listen to this. God encourages His people by encouraging their leader, the guy with the weird name, Zerubbabel, with this inspiring vision of the future. At the core of this message is the reality, like I said earlier, that God is completely and totally and absolutely in control. God's never out of the loop. He didn't put us here with us being in control, He's not just up in heaven wondering what's going to happen next, but God is fully in control of what's going to happen. Listen to this little excerpt from, from an article that I read. That there was this church that put an ad in a local newspaper, and I know we're a few weeks removed from Easter, but, but I, I ran across this, and this church had put an ad in a local newspaper advertising their Easter service. And the title of the Easter program was supposed to be Our God Reigns. But the newspaper, when it came out, had a typo. And instead of it saying Our God Reigns, their Easter service was labeled Our God Resigns. <laughs> and I thought, man, what a difference one letter makes, right? You talk about a dud of an Easter service. But maybe, maybe, just maybe, that typo is more true in our experience than we care to admit sometimes. Many, many Christians, listen to me, and I wouldn't lie to you, I've been there, done that. We live as if God has resigned, not as if He truly reigns as the sovereign God of the universe. S statistics intrigue me, and, and, and understand me, I'm not some naive dude that thinks that everything you Google is truth, right? Like, like, like the, just in case you didn't know, this is a whole side sermon 
But the whole internet is not true. Right? It's just not. But listen, did you know, and these come from some pretty reliable sources, that about 70% of pastors, and remember this message goes to Zerubbabel, their leader, this last one we're about to look at. Do you know that 70, about 70% 70 of pastors constantly fight depression? About 80% of pastors and their wives feel discouraged in their work. And do you know, I thought that was very compelling, but do you know what the numbers are for believers who are serving and leading in their churches, who are also ministers of the gospel, whether they're vocational ministers or not? About 70% of all believers fight, constantly fight depression. About 80% of men and their wives who are serving God together feel discouraged in their work when they're trying to have a kingdom focus. And I would add this, for millions and millions of Christians, if we aren't careful, we can easily develop that perspective that if we look around us in our culture, we could develop, listen to this, we could develop this, this perspective that evil is winning. Couldn't we? I mean, all we got to do is wake up in the morning and look at our world right now, and we could say the enemy is winning this thing. But I'm just going to tell you this morning the enemy is not winning this thing. Jesus won it on the cross of Calvary. In, in spite of all the Christian influence and the Christian resources available in this country, evil is escalating. It's at an unimaginable place. I mean, the past 35 years is an incredible change in our world. Moral standards are, are, are dropping like lead. E even, even people who didn't always agree with a lot of those moral standards before would keep them because it was societally acceptable. But now, listen to me, we've said it many times before, now many, e many professing Christians do not even live by the standards of God's Word. People, people are flaunting sin as though it's a badge of honor to flaunt sin. We're living in a day, listen to me, where very few churches take a stand on absolute truth. Where, uh, whether it be morally or doctrinally, the, the, the gospel, we're living in a day where people are making the gospel say what they want it to say, and it's not a true biblical gospel anymore. The, the gospel has been changed in, in many places from how a person can be saved and about the reality of God's judgment to the gospel is now about God's personal fulfillment to make you happy. It, it, it's, it, it's upon us. We are walking through it. We're seeing it in our world. We're living in a world where, where Christian churches in name, denominations, whatever they may be, are focused more on social debates of our time, where they are caught up in whatever it may be, whether it's critical race theory, homosexuality, other sin, whatever it may be, what the marriage and family doc, you know, standards and all this, where the Bible has very, very, very clear standards that are non-negotiable, and we know what the Bible says, but people still want to make it say what they want it to say. And it's very important that we have correct theology and very true Christology as we look at God's Word. And that's the world we're living in. And that's what Haggai was facing. It shouldn't come as a surprise to us. It was even happening in biblical times. And so for the fourth time, the second time actually on the same day, the Word of the Lord came again. I want you to look at the Scripture. Haggai chapter 2. You're like, man... We're just now getting to the Scripture. Yep, here we go. Listen. Haggai chapter 2, verse 20 through 23. The second time on the same day, but this is the fourth message that God gave for Haggai to give to the people. But this one was to go to Zerubbabel directly. It says, The word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai on the 24th day of the month. Speak to Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, saying this, I'm about to shake the heavens and the earth and to overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I'm about to destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the nations and overthrow the chariots and their riders, and the horses and their riders shall go down, every one by the sword of his brother. On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, declares the Lord, and make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord of of hosts. Now, what is this telling us this morning? We could sum up this message with four simple lessons, and that's the way I want to approach it this morning. So if you're taking notes, here we go. The first thing is this. Understand this. 
We see it very clearly in these last four verses. Number one, leaders have to remain faithful. Leaders have to remain faithful. Notice what verse 21 says. It says that God told Haggai to speak to Zerubbabel. He was their leader. I, I, found, I find it fascinating that God's final message is not to the people in general, but to their leader, Zerubbabel. Listen, every success and failure can usually be traced back to one source, and that is to leadership. It, it doesn't matter, and some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. It doesn't matter whether it's a local business or a multinational corporation. It doesn't matter whether it's on the job or in the home, whether it's being a mom or dad, parenting, marriage, in the church, on the ball field. Leadership makes a difference, doesn't it? It applies just as much to a 12-year-old basketball team as it does to the United States government. Leadership makes a difference. Leadership matters, but sometimes, here's what happens. Leaders get discouraged. They get unfocused, and they get off track. And evidently, that's what was happening to Zerubbabel. And, and honestly, you, you can kind of understand it a, a little bit. After all, he was... The one who led the people back from Babylon only to find the situation worse than it was before, worse than he ever imagined. So all the familiar landmarks in Jerusalem had disappeared. The city walls were torn down. The foreign soldiers were marching through the streets every day. The, the temple, the magnificent temple of Solomon was nothing but utterly destroyed. There was nothing left. I mean, nothing at all. The people were rebuilding a nation from scratch. And here's the deal. Only a leader knows the burdens that a leader bears. When you lead, there's this pressure that weighs you down. People have act, often asked me, like, is it fun being a pastor? And I'll tell them, heck no. <laughs> and it is. I, I mean, I love doing it, but there's a weight that comes with knowing that you share the gospel and you're responsible for sharing it accurately and with truth. And anybody that leads in anything, you know the, the burden of doing, of, of doing it right. There's a weight and a responsibility you carry. And none of us are immune to it if we are Christians. Because listen to me real close. Christians, listen to me real close. Christians are supposed to be leaders. If anybody's leading in our world, it ought to be Christians. And we may feel alone sometimes. Gosh, yes, we're going to feel alone. We may feel defeated sometimes. We may feel like we need to give up sometimes. But if we are gods, then we can because if we are God's people, just like Haggai did with Zerubbabel, he will speak. You, you know those times, listen to me real close, those times where the Lord taps you on the shoulder and it's that still small voice of God saying, listen, I know things are tough, but you're not alone. I've been watching you through all your trials and there's a reason you're walking through them. You may not ever understand it this side of heaven, but you are mine. You are mine and you are my leader. And I want you to remain firm and strong in your faith and walk with me. I've been on your side this whole time and I'm not going to leave you now. I'm with you. That's the God we serve. That's why it's so important to remain faithful. When the going gets tough, leaders remain faithful. The, the hardest part of rebuilding the temple for them had, was not the manual labor. The hardest part was sticking with it. The hardest part had just become putting the next stone in place. Don't we find that to be true sometimes? Sometimes the hardest part is the next part, right? One foot in front of the other. Sometimes, listen, we just got to get up, get out of bed, and put one foot in front of the other and walk by faith. One pastor said about this, sometimes it's just so difficult to keep on going when you're hip deep in alligators with no way to drain the swamp. Man, I can relate. That's exactly how Zerubbabel felt. There, there were fightings within. There were fears from the outside. He looked at his discouraged, fickled workers. He listened to the opponents. He surveyed the massive job before him. And he just felt like giving up. And at this point, God says, Tell Zerubbabel that I've got a message for him. And that message is simple. Just keep doing your job faithfully because I'm watching after you every day. Listen, listen to me real close. Listen, if you spend your life chasing success, it will be a miserable, miserable life. God does not call us to be successful. He calls us to be faithful. And when we're faithful, 
long enough and we walk with Him in the ways He calls us to, then we have a very excellent chance of being successful in the end. That's a good word for us. Listen, that's a great word for moms and dads and graduating seniors and for people who feel a little bit lost right now in the whirlwind of life, for business owners and workers. It's a great word for us as a church. Just be faithful when all is said and done. If you're faithful, then that means success. You, you can't separate leadership from faithfulness. Leaders have to remain faithful. Here's the second thing. Not only do leaders have to remain faithful, but secondly, we have to remember that life is in God's hands. Life is in God's hands. Life is fleeting. It's not guaranteed. That's the second lesson in this passage that, that God wants us to understand that. In verses 21 and 22, He said, I'm going to shake the nations. I'm going to overturn the throne of kingdoms and I will overthrow chariots and I'll overthrow their riders. So here's the deal. And let's just be real honest this morning. I've been there, done that, and I bet you have too. While we're spending our time worrying about the economy or whether or not the market will go up or down or whether or not the Braves are ever going to get back on a winning streak or how good is Alabama or Auburn going to be next year, we have to remember that God has bigger fish to fry. We're not guaranteed one more millisecond on this earth. Nothing is certain in our ever-changing world. Solomon ponders this predicament he wrote these telling words in Ecclesiastes. Listen to this. Here's what Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 9, 11, and 12. It's so telling. Listen. Here is this man of wisdom. And he says, the ra listen to this. He says, The race is not to the swift or the battle to the strong, nor does food come to the wise or wealth to the brilliant or favor to the learned, but time and chance happen to them all. Moreover, no man knows when his hour will come. Listen, no one knows when his hour will come. We, and I've never been like a doomsday kind of guy, but no one knows when his hour will come. We all expect to pray to, 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 you know, and pray that we're going to live long, happy lives. And, and, and that's the prayer. You know, again, when I think about our high school graduates, I'm, I'm excited for them. They, they, I, think, you know, I think, man, what a bright future. But above everything else, whether it's a high school senior or some of you old people I was talking to earlier who are probably nodding off to sleep right now. Listen, wake up. Listen, real close, listen. Listen, above everything else, remember that your life is in God's hands. Let us reflect this morning on the power of God's providence. Listen, God alone holds the power of life and death in His hands. God opens a door that no man can shut, and He closes a door that no man can open. If we are biblical Christians, it ought to give us enormous confidence when we, pro when we face the problems of life, when we, when we are wise and we humble ourselves before God and we seek Him in all that we do. Leaders have to remain faithful. Life is in God's hands. And here's the third thing. Earthly kingdoms will fall. It goes hand in hand. Earthly kingdoms will fall. Our text contains a third reminder relating to the, to the overthrow of earthly kingdoms. Listen, there's going to come a day when God is going to shake the heavens and the earth. In that day, everything made by the hand of man will come crashing down. It makes me think about Revelation chapter 16. If you haven't read it, don't, don't do it right now. Listen to the rest of the sermon. But listen, I, I want to encourage you. Go read Revelation 16 this week. Revelation 16, 17 through 20 describes that day. And it, and it connects to the battle of Armageddon just before Jesus returns to the earth. But listen to what Listen to what it says. Listen. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, that scripture says. And out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne saying, It is not possibly done, or it might happen. It says, It is done. Then there came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder and a severe earthquake. No earthquake like it's ever occurred since man's been on the earth. So tremendous was the quake. The great city split into three parts and the cities of the nations collapsed. God remembered Babylon the great and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath. Every island fled away and the mountains could not be found. I know that's weird stuff to think about. And, and our world denies it and lives as though it's not going to happen. But if we believe in biblical integrity, then we must trust and know that everything that man builds will come to an end. It, it, it's that way with everything that's of this world. John told us in his first epistle, he said... The world and its desires pass away. That's 1 John 2.17. 
Jesus said in Matthew 24, 35, he said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. The, listen, here's the best way to sum it up. The best that this world has to offer is going to come to an end. It'll all die someday. Earthly kingdoms will fall. So we got to remember, leaders have to remain faithful. Life is in God's hands. Earthly kingdoms will fall. Here's the fourth and last thing this morning. And this is the encouragement in it. There is an eternal reward for God's chosen people. There is an eternal reward for God's chosen people. In our text, this short book of Haggai, we see that it closes with some very comforting words. Listen to God's final message. This last verse, verse 23. On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shiltil, declares the Lord, and make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord, declares the Lord of hosts. Now, let's take just a second before we go, and I want you to listen real close. Most of us are probably not familiar with the concept of a signet ring. Probably the most um, probably the most contemporary analogy would be something like an identification badge that allows you access into a closed area or allows you access to highly classified information. So you kind of get what I'm saying, like an access badge. I, I've, I've not had many of those in my life, um, but I can remember one time, and I'm going to tell on myself here this morning, that your pastor is, has not been sinless in his life. But in 1992, I went down to New Orleans hoping I could get in the national championship game to watch Alabama play Miami. I didn't have a ticket. And, and me and a buddy, we were standing outside the Superdome in Louisiana. We were about to give up because you couldn't buy tickets on the street there. And, and the ones you could find, if you could find anybody, and at that time it was a lot of money. They were like six or $700 a piece. And we were just poor college students, and we were like, you know, we're not, we're not going to do that, so we'll just go watch it somewhere. And so we were just going to be down there and be around. You know, we're hoping Alabama was going to crush them. And they did, by the way. That's a whole different sermon. But listen, here, here's the deal. Um, so we're standing outside. We're standing outside on the mezzanine in front, of, in front of the Superdome. And this little guy walks up with a clipboard. He said, hey, man, hey, man, you want the game? I was like, yeah, we want the game. And he said, I've got a press badge for you. Press badge. Okay, I can be a press guy for a day. And so we paid him 40 bucks a piece. We got a press badge. We walked right up to the gate, and I think it was his girlfriend working the gate. And he said, "He said, press, press, press." We walked through. We walked in the game, and he said, "See you later, man." And uh, he walked off, and we're standing in the Superdome, the Alabama game. And you could do that back in the day. I've told my kids, don't do that now. But we used to go to games, and there'd be ten thousand more people in the stand in the stadium than would fit. They would be all around the, the 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 ramps and stuff. People watching the games, and so. We, I ended up watching the national championship game in person. Ended up with a seat in the second half and, and watching, watching the game. But that was my access. I had the badge, so I got in. Now, the sin in it is I didn't get it legally and it wasn't right, and I repented of that sin. Um, okay, and, and God, knows, God knows my heart. But, but I had access, and that, that's what this was. That's what a signet ring was. When an ancient king wanted to affix his seal to a document, he would take his signet ring, he would impress it into this soft wax, which would harden and make an unbreakable seal. Thus, the signet ring was much more than just a decorative ring that they wore. It signified honor, authority, ownership, preservation. Um, and and it, it showed this special relationship that the king who had the signet ring had to guarantee his nation things and rites of passage and all these things that they could, that they could have. Now, here's something interesting. Okay, now get this, just, just, just real quick. Zerubbabel, this guy that this message comes to, had a grandfather and his name was Jehoiakim. Now you don't have to memorize that, but his name was Jehoiakim. Well, I don't know why they couldn't have normal names. Like in the 70s, everybody was Jason and Jeremy and Scott. Right? But these guys are like Zerubbabel and Jehoiakim. So, so his grandfather was named Jehoiakim. And many years earlier, he had been one of the last kings before they were exiled from Judah to Babylon. He was a wicked king who did not serve the Lord. In Jeremiah chapter 22, God pronounced a curse upon Zerubbabel's grandfather Jehoiakim in which he said, you, listen to this, he said, you are like a signet ring in my hand that because of your sin, I'm taking you off of my finger. How would you like to be that guy? 
And then he sentenced Jehoiakim to deportation to Babylon, never to return to Israel, and he didn't. And finally he uttered these words. He said, here's what he said about Jehoiakim. He said, write this man down as childless, a man who shall not prosper in his days, for none of his descendants shall prosper sitting on the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. That's Jeremiah 22, 30. So Jehoiakim was being told that not only would he be punished, but all his descendants would be punished, and none of them would ever sit on the throne of David. Remember, kings and kingdoms fall, right? But now God, listen to this, but here we are in the Scripture, and now God says to Zerubbabel, I will make you like a signet ring. Now, here's where we see the grace of God at work. And I just want to say this morning, aren't you thankful this morning that God is a God of grace? And when He saves you out of His sin, He doesn't save you because you deserved it, but He did it out of His grace. Because of Zerubbabel's faithfulness, the curse of his family is lifted. The signet ring is back on God's finger. Now, get this. This is a great example. And this is about biblical integrity of how you cannot disconnect any part of the Bible from Jesus Christ. Whether it's Revelation to Genesis, you've heard me say it before, it's all about Jesus. Listen, Zerubbabel himself never sat on the throne of David. But get this, this is, this is cool. Y'all with me? Y'all want something cool? Alright, listen. Zerubbabel never sat on the throne of David, just as God had said. But one of his descendants did. If you read Matthew chapter 1, verse 12 in the Gospels, it mentions the name Zerubbabel in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Zerubbabel never made it to the throne, of his, as, but his descendant, Jesus Christ, did forever and ever. We, we know it because the angel Gabriel said of Jesus, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Centuries later, by God's providence, by God's love, by God's grace, by God's mer mercy, a baby was born in Bethlehem who was the lineal descendant of Zerubbabel, God's signet friend. So the book of Haggai, this little book in the Old Testament, ends with a word of encouragement to a discouraged leader. And it was God's way of saying, don't give up. Don't ever give up. You have no idea of how great my plans are for you. Jesus is coming. When, listen. I just want to tell you this morning, when you want to give up, this may sound really simple, don't do it. When you feel like giving up, don't do it. We're not to spend our time, the scripture says we're not to spend our time predicting the end of the world, that we would be crazy not to see that the times are upon us. And what should we be doing? We should be serving the Lord. Look at this, this is the last thing. Look at Luke chapter 21, verse 28. When all these things begin to take place, here's what the scripture says. It says, stand up, lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. Build your life on the things that will last forever, and you'll never be disappointed. It's time to stand up and to lift our heads. Would you stand with me this morning? Let's stand up. Let's lift our heads toward the heavens. Let's praise God for who He is. Listen, I just want to say this as we pray and dismiss this morning. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then we are available to talk with you. This is our way of invitation right now. If you need somebody to talk to, we will take time to talk with you and share with you what the Scripture says. Not what I say, not what any of our leaders here in our church say, but what God says about having a relationship with Jesus Christ. Life has to be on the eternal. If you don't know the eternal, it only comes through Christ. And we will tell you how to do that. If you're a believer and you're walking through discouragement, I urge you, get back on track. Get focused on Jesus. Don't give up. Walk with Him in faithfulness, okay? Let's pray together. Father, we thank You for this day that You have given us to come and worship together as the body of Christ as Your church. Lord, we need You more than we realize sometimes. God, You are the answer to life. Lord, You have given everything so that we can live. Find us thankful for the blood of Christ, for the cross, and for Your resurrection and for the hope that comes alone in a relationship with you. Lord, we, uh, we praise you and thank you as the church gathers this morning. We hope that what's been done in this place over this hour, God has honored you. Lord, we want to do what we do in spirit and truth, and we want, to, uh, we want to worship you when we come together. Lord, as we dismiss, Lord, again, we pray for those that may not know you, that even today may be a day of salvation. We pray for encouragement for believers to walk in your ways. 
And God, this morning as, as we dismiss, we pray like we do every week, Lord, that we would realize the church is not a building, but it's your people. And that we wouldn't cease being the church when we walk out of these doors, God. That we would be a light in our world, in our community, in a world that desperately needs you. It's what, you, it's what this world needs the most. So, Lord, as you put us in places this week, in our families, in our workplaces, in our schools, wherever we go, that we would be a light for you. Lord, we pray this in Christ's name and God's people say together.